And now, the show that bridges the gap between faith and business. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. On today's show, Cord Sachs, CEO of Fire Seeds. Doing away with all of the dichotomies, the, the walls we build up, the silos. When, when, when the Lord did that in my life and that, and, and that perspective, it really changed everything. And now I see it all as worship. I see it all as stewardship. I see it all as a conversation that I bring my kids in, I bring my wife in. And man, it's so much more fun. Hello, folks. This is Ray Hilbert, your co-host at Bottom Line Faith. And wow, we're excited for another edition of the program where we interview some of America's top Christ followers who are in business leadership and in the marketplace and where we learn best practices, lessons learned, failures, successes, and all the things that we need to know about as Christ followers in business. If this is your first time checking out the Bottom Line Faith program, welcome. You can learn about all the other episodes of our program at bottomlinefaith.org. We'd encourage you to go check that out. Also, if you're a Christ follower leading a company or organization, if you're looking for tools and resources and encouragement, uh, perhaps would even like to learn about roundtable groups for your peers, check out our ministry website at truthatwork.org. It is our ministry ministry at Truth at Work that presents the Bottom Line Faith program. So please check out truthatwork.org to learn about resources and roundtable programs in a city near you. Well, folks, I am excited about this edition. Buckle up because we have an amazing leader that is going to be our guest today, Cord Sachs is our guest, and we are in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. I'm looking out the window at a beautifully, beautifully designed spring day cord. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Ray, it's glad, I'm glad to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be a part. Man, I tell you what, just before we've gone on recording, we've got a chance to spend some time together, and your energy is uh, contagious. I can just tell you're fired up to be here and share lessons and all those things that you've learned, and we're going to learn more about your journey and your company as we go along. So, man, you ready to get rolling? Awesome. Let's do it. That is great. So let's learn a little bit more about your background, Court. How did you come to Christ and kind of just how did you become who you are? Yeah, I I would have to trace that back to my father and just how he came to Christ was a big part of even my influence now. And I think what God's been, what God has used to prepare me for who who I am today and what I do today. And so I tell a little bit of his story and it goes a little bit like this. He brought up as a Catholic, very vivacious individual, never met a stranger, uh, go for the gusto type of guy and a big business guy, big, uh, big developer and developed a lot of uh, properties or developed early Vail Village and, and, and yet didn't know Christ. So mid '80s, uh, housing crisis, interest rates go through the roof, 23%. He starts losing everything, and a college minister of all people uh, runs into him at the McDonald's and shares the bridge diagram with him, and it's the first time he hears the gospel. Uh, he takes that back to a meeting with his lawyer, and, and his lawyer, who is a believer, begins to unpack and help him understand more of this good news that he's, he's never really connected the dots with. So he comes to Christ through those two two individuals, and then um, you know the type of guy that's not going to go, you know, he's not going to do anything halfway, so he starts, <laughs> he goes and finds a, a another leader and, and, and asks you know, how do I grow? I want to do every, you know, whatever it takes to grow. And this leader happened to be a, an old NAV staff that had a NAV home up in uh, out, out near Camp Pendleton, uh, California, near the Marine base, and had 12 Marines living with him. And so my dad is being discipled by this NAV uh, who's, who's housing 12 Marines. And I, as a kid, a little six-year-old kid, I remember going up with him every Friday for his D group, for his discipleship group. So that was kind of my my early initial you know influence. And just, I didn't know what was going on, but as I look back, I see that having a profound impact on what shaped me today. And so, so I, I come to Christ uh, about 14 at an FCA camp, and my dad was very intentional, my hero. I lost him 10 years ago. He was very intentional to, to develop me, to disciple me, to invest in me, pour into me. A uh, big part of my story is just his legacy being, wow. being invested into me. And so we moved from uh, California to Gunnersville, Alabama, where uh, I got to watch him build a business out of the back of his truck and really do business as mission. And all he knew, to, knew as a new believer was, yeah, 
you you get in the Word, you pray, uh, you share your faith, and if, if people come to Christ, you disciple them. And I got to see him disciple subs and, and clients and, and just all sorts of folks. As I'd walk into his office, he'd be praying, he'd be sharing his faith, he'd be in the Word with someone. And, and all those people, of course, ended up at his funeral in the line and said, hey, your dad changed my life. Your dad spent uh, wow. time and investing in me. So I got to, this was kind of the backdrop. I was very fortunate to kind of have this as my backdrop uh, as I moved into college and um, and then uh, was discipled uh, in, in college by a, a guy who was on staff with a ministry called Campus Outreach. And then, you know, it just totally changed my life. Uh, I saw the, the reflection of what my dad had done in this man and, and just knew this is what I wanted to give my life to. I wanted to disciple others as I saw the impact uh, it had on me. So brings you up to college. And, and from there, you know, I, I thought I'd go straight into business. I loved business. I was an entrepreneur at heart. I started yeah. a couple of businesses in college. Uh, but then I was challenged to go on staff with ministry called Campus Outreach. Mm-hmm. That's where I spent the next seven years investing in, in the football team and just really seeing God take one man uh, that, that just kind of did what was modeled for him. I spent my time just investing in, the, you know, three or four young knucklehead freshman football players, and and I saw them come to Christ. I saw them grow. I saw them catch this vision to give their life away. Fast forward four years, they're about to graduate, and there's been a movement that's taken place. As I see, we counted up 67 football players are involved some in some way in a Bible study, an evangelistic experience. Uh, they, they've been on summer beach projects. They, they were in this movement, and, and that's where I said, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to give my life to as I move forward, whatever domain I'm put in. Yep. Uh, and I just knew at that point it was, it was time to move to a new season. They were calling me sir in the dorms, and, and, and I had three kids at this time. So I then uh, I, I, made the, I made the choice to, to really move, start my first company. And I really wanted to see is what I have been had been challenging these, these graduates to do for seven years, these athletes, to go out in the world, to bloom where they're planted. And, and you know, 95% of them were going to the marketplace. They weren't going into ministry. And yet I had never really lived out my faith in the marketplace. And I knew this was this was a time I had to go see, can I can I do that? I'd heard from many godly men that, you know, it, it's probably not the easiest place to disciple and to do ministries in the workplace. And, you know, maybe I should just focus on the, the, the transitioning out of ministry and just getting involved in a Sunday school class. But I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine the, the bait and switch, if that wasn't true, that I've told all these these guys to go out and to, to minister in, in the marketplace. And so I had to go see, can I, can, can you disciple men? Uh, is and, it real? And, and is it real? Can you really do it? Yeah, is that what yeah. we're supposed to to live our faith out, uh, where we're where we're called to go and, and where we're going to spend the majority of our life? So so you started a company. What was that company? So I started a company. It was called Booster uh, with yeah. a partner of mine that graduated from Sanford with me. We started a company called Booster. Uh, it did elementary school fundraising, of uh-huh. all things. Yeah. And so all, all we knew is that we had a, we had a good product, if you will, a service where we could help elementary school uh, schools raise a lot of money through a fitness based fund run. Uh, but the unique thing we did is we went and we we recruited these athletes of all people to come and work at an elementary school fundraising company, and we promised them two things: we will invest in you holistically, in a sense, we'll disciple you in the context of work, and we'll teach you business. And if you're with us for a year and, and you buy into both of those things, and you're really good at what you do, we'll let you take a team and you'll launch into a new city. And fast forward seven years, and that company multiplied from four of us in a basement to 17 cities, a couple hundred team members, and, uh, and I saw it again. What I'd seen on the campus, a multiplying movement of multiplying leaders in that football team, I saw in a for-profit company, a multiplying movement of multiplying leaders, this time in business. And I remember saying, this is what I want to give my life to. Uh, God's refining my Mm -hmm. story, refining my calling. Uh, And that's when I started Fire Seeds. And we're going to learn now what Fire Seeds is. But folks, uh, if you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Cord Sachs. He's the CEO of Fire Seeds. And we've heard a little bit of Cord's background. So Cord, tell us a little bit about why the name Fire Seeds and then help us understand what the company does. And and, and I'll give you the name Fire Seeds, but before I do that, if I don't include and interject into my story the fact that I have an unbelievable wife and six kids. Um, our whole tagline with Fire Seeds is multiplying leaders. And so if, if I share that part of my story or if I miss, you may I may lose some credibility in our in our in our buying into multiplying leaders. So a big part of who I am and why I do what I do and how I try to build my business yeah. uh, so that I can have my impact there. Uh, but Fire Seeds, where does it come from? It comes from really I had the name way before I started the business. I love 
the fact that the two elements, fire and seeds, they represent two different elements, but they both have to do with exponential impact, exponential growth, multiplication. One, the fire represents the trials you go through, the challenges, the training, the development, the hardships that, that make a leader. Uh, and then the seeds represent the fruit and the, uh, the growth, but, but both multiply uh, and have exponential impact. I'm looking at your logo on your shirt right now. I'm sure you get asked about that quite a bit. And boy, that's just a great story right there. Yeah, it's a fun story to tell. And I can store it, sell it in the 60-second version or, you know, the, the version that we're, we're, we're sharing today. So. Awesome. That's a great transition. So tell us what it is that the company does. Well, I, I, let me start with my vision, our vision and our mission, uh, because that's that's who we are. Everything flows up to vision and mission, and then of course values. But, but the vision of, of Fire Seeds is we want to glorify God through multiplying movements of multiplying leaders in the four purpose market space. We've had that vision from day one, uh, as we saw a very strategic place, the being business, to where we could come alongside other business leaders who also they would also agree that I want to use my business domain on purpose, uh, and we. Want want to help them create a movement of leaders that multiply. And so the mission, how we do that, that's our legacy statement, that's our Mm -hmm. why, how we do that is our mission. We discover, deploy, and develop multiplying leaders. So everything's around this theme of multiplying leaders, but the, the discovery is uh, is search. It's recruiting. We have a search firm, uh, if you will, that finds and, and vets and then places multiplying leaders. A multiplying leader is someone we'd say has high character, high drive, and they have an intrinsic value of investing in other people, of building right. and developing other people. And when you get those three things right, that really does cover a multitude of the intangibles when you're recruiting leaders. And so we'd say our niche is recruiting leaders to values. Uh, we partner with what we call purpose-driven organizations, and that's the, the deployment component of, of our mission. We discover, we deploy multiplying leaders. And the most important thing I do is vet out and partner with what we call a purpose-driven organization, a company that gets the fact that I, they have a domain where they're going to influence uh, yeah. people for the majority of their lives. The 80,000 hours that we spend wor- at work is more time than we spend anywhere in any other domain at work or, or at home or in our church or in our community combined. Mind. And so they get, I want to use this very intentionally. I want, I want to invest in my culture very intentionally. I care about my people. I want part of my legacy to be left through my, my company. That's a purpose-driven organization for us. So when we can partner with that purpose-driven organization to recruit or then the last part of our mission, develop multiplying leaders, we help companies build leader development tracks within their organization through a platform called WildSpark, WildSpark Leader Development. Those three things are very crucial in us seeing the, the vision of these multiplying movements take place. Really exciting stuff, and and I think uh, maybe a client or two to give folks the uh, framework of the types of companies you serve. To, to give us an example or two of the kind of companies you'd serve. Uh, yeah, I'll start local. We've got a, a great company that we we serve here. We started with with Iron Tribe, okay. a fitness company here in Birmingham, Alabama. They started with six gyms local here in Birmingham. A purpose driven organization, purpose driven leaders. They want to use the gym and the world of of group fitness in a very excellent way to engage people and have an impact on their lives very holistically. So fit our definition. uh, And we've been able to place over 115 now leaders for them uh, here in Birmingham, but then all over the country. They've got gyms literally all over over the United States. And so um, we've had the unbelievable privilege over the last year of partnering with Chick-fil-A. And uh, we're we're serving over 100 franchisees over the last nine months, uh, some with recruiting and others with leader development. So obviously uh, another purpose-driven organization that wants to glorify God and have an impact through their through their platform. And we all know the influence that they've had on so many and even the business expectation of how we as believers can use uh, use our businesses to have a, have a kingdom impact. So a big hero of ours, uh, and we're very privileged to partner alongside them too. That's, that is great stuff. Folks, you can see why I was so excited to have this conversation with Cord. You can just sense his encouragement, his enthusiasm, and the calling that God has on his life to, to really impact so many leaders in the marketplace through his company at Fire Seeds. And by the way, uh, Cord, if uh, someone is uh, wanting to check you out and le- learn about you online, where, where, would they, where would they find you? Yeah, go to fireseeds.com. Easy so, enough. Yeah, pretty easy. Fireseedsplural.com. And then you can learn all about us. You can learn about our recruiting, learn about our leader development in one stop. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, folks, this is Ray Hilbert, your co-host at the Bottom Line Faith Program. And we are interviewing Cord Sachs, the CEO of Fireseeds here in Birmingham, Alabama. 
So, Cord, we've had a chance to learn more about your background. Now we have a better understanding of your company, why you exist, what you do. So now I'd like to take a little bit different direction. Let's talk about lessons learned. Let's talk about what's got you to this point, and hopefully this can now be a, a time of encouragement. You know, as we mm-hmm. talk about a lot on the program, there's probably someone listening right now to this. Maybe they're a first-time listener, and they've just downloaded this podcast, and they're wondering, you know, what's this all about? So maybe they're discouraged. Maybe they've got a tough situation in their company, their leadership, maybe a, a difficult situation with an employee or a customer or a vendor. So we're just praying that God will use the next few moments as an encouragement to that Christ follower in, in leadership. So tell us a little bit about maybe the hardest decision that you can recall making in business, and how did your faith play a role in that decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say all of the hardest decisions all go back to people and uh, and usually coming to a point where you you know in your heart and you know not just in your heart, but you know in your mind, you know the, the pragmatic side of a decision to move them to a new season of, of impact somewhere else um, it, it is always a hard, hard decision. And so we, we take that very seriously. I think um, what makes that a little bit easier if we're having continual dialogue around, uh, around the field. Uh, and the productivity of any of any of our folks that that, that work on our teams and uh, and in our company, and so um, with those ongoing conversations, these conversations, this final conversation, if you will, doesn't have to be a grievous uh, major breakup. It really can be a launching of a team member into really. What, what I said, the next season of their impact. And, and really the, the principle that we see playing out there, and we use this in our, in our recruiting and in a lot of our, our worldview or our business worldview, is Ephesians, Ephesians 2.10, that, that, that God's created us, we're, we're his workmanship, uh, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance that we might walk in them. If you really believe in in God's providence and his goodness and that he did create these works in advance, then there is a specific season for your work, for my work, for all of our listeners' work. And and there's many times where he decides, I'm going to move you on, and he's going to use your productivity. He's going to use your fit. He's going to use maybe your energy level being drained for a number of different reasons or changes that might have happened in your role to move you on. And so just gaining that perspective and helping the the other party gain that perspective that you know the providence of God is, is different from the sovereignty of God. They're the same in, in, in the all-powerful nature of who he is. But yet R.C. Sproul would say the providence of God is his hand moving every molecule, whereas the sovereignty of God is his broad power reaching into the universe. We understand the providential nature of how he aligns circumstances in work to move someone to where they're not producing anymore. I really do believe that's a that's the kindness of him to move them to a scenario where they can maximize their productivity. They can maximize bringing a return on the talents that they have. And anytime we, we, we have a gauge of, of a lack of productivity or energy or passion, that's, that's typically a sign that that it's time to move on. So helping the individual understand that, and if that can happen in a dialogue along the way, it makes those decisions and those final, the final affirmation of those decisions and confirmation of the decisions a lot easier. But it's still probably the hardest thing to do is move people on. <laughs> well, in doing what I've done, true that worked for the last 17 years and having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of conversations with Christians who own businesses, when it comes to this issue around people, you're right, that's the biggest challenge. And when it comes to underperforming employees, it seems like they always hold on too long. They always, well, let's just wait a couple more weeks. Maybe they'll figure it out. But the big problem, and this is what I heard you talk about, and I love this. The big problem is when there's a surprise. So you really are reinforcing the importance that continual dialogue makes it a transition and not a transaction. That's right. If, if the employee, the team member is surprised, that's my fault. That's on me as the leader. Uh, I have not done a good job of having an ongoing conversation or even be, being a steward of, of putting metrics in place uh, and then dialogue in place within my culture to help someone know that there should be a season of me trying to, to, to do everything I can to resource them, to train them, uh, to, to help them be productive. But then we should both come to the conclusion at a certain point that, hey, it's time to move on because this is obviously not where, where they're having their biggest impact. That is great. So perhaps we have a listener right now. Maybe that piece of the conversation was just for them. Maybe they've been wrestling with this leader in their company or this employee in their company, and 
And maybe God's convicting him right now as the leader of that person saying, you know what, you haven't had this continual mm. dialogue, and uh, you're talking about or thinking about terminating them, and would it be a surprise? And if it's going to be a surprise, that falls on us to deal with that, right? That's right. Creating a culture of feedback is one of the, yeah. the most strategic and grace-centered things you can do uh, in giving true, tough love to your folks at, at any time and, and allowing these things to be dialogues and conversations uh, and not surprises. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not gracious to surprise somebody with a transition. It, it's much more gracious. It's much more intentional. You're being much more of a steward of your environment by building that into your culture, building a culture of feedback within. Well, I'm really curious along those, along those lines then, uh, Cord, because so often, for whatever reason, that leader does not communicate. And maybe is it conflict avoidance? Is it, hey, I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings? Or what's going on in your experience with that leader as to why they're not having that kind of candid, ongoing conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is identity, personality driven. There are folks that love to give feedback and give it all the time. And there's those that that'll, will avoid conflict like the plague. And I think there's some definitely some scenarios that have to be addressed there. But I think if you build into your organization a, a high expectation of, of stewardship, then in order to do that, you have to have key metrics that people can align with and know if they're being a steward. And so I think as business leaders, that's a stewardship principle that we have to put in place. Key metrics, key KPIs, if you will, key performance indexes in any given scenario. And then there needs to be a regular formal conversation with those folks. I mean, we do it once a quarter. Um, we did it today. Uh, just just this morning, we had our, our half day of... Uh, no, wait, of wait, wait, hold on. i got to interrupt you. Are you saying that the annual performance review is not enough. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I thought that's where you're headed. If Keep you're going. relying on an, an, an annual performance review, you have missed the mark. I'm just going to go ahead and say, I don't care Thank who you. you are, I don't care what industry you're in. If you're engaging once a month to give feedback, uh, it's not enough. Once and, a year. Well, I'm sorry, once a year, yeah, it, yeah. it's not enough. Yeah, right. once a month would be probably uh, a little aggressive. But, but yeah, there's a formal yeah. avenue of letting our folks know where they stand, and, and really on both, on two sides of the equation. One is culturally, and the whole vision, mission, and values. Are you living those out? That's a conversation we have every quarter. And then secondly, are you meeting the standards and the goals and the metrics that we have in place? Because if not, we can adjust that next quarter. But if I don't have a conversation with you but once a year, that's not fair for me to, to go all year long and not know that I should be adjusting and improving and growing and seeking help somewhere. So, yeah, that's a big hot button for me, too. I could tell, and that's why I wanted to go there. And the other side of that is it seems like, from my experience, if we only do this once a year, it's very subjective. It's kind of like, what have you done for me lately? And you're only thinking about the last week or perhaps the last two weeks and what's going on. But if we haven't been documenting ongoing conversations as part of the review process, then we're shortchanging that teammate, are we not? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's really good. As you look back, you're a young man. How, how old are you? Uh, I'd be 42. Oh, my goodness. Couple young, months. young, 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 young fellow. As you look back, if you had to say, wow, I wish I'd have done this differently in your career, in your business or whatever, what would be one thing that you would say, I wish I had done this piece differently? Um, I wish I had infused or had understood this whole principle of the difference between that which is secular and sacred is only that which we create. That was a D Dallas Willard quote. In trying to create work-life balance, I created dichotomies in my life yeah. that separated my wife from my business and, and our conversations, and, and, and it led to us early in my first business of almost being ships passing in the, in the night, doing away with all of the dichotomies, the, yeah. the walls the we silos, build up, right? the silos. Yeah. When the Lord did that in my life and that, and, and that perspective, it really changed everything. And now I see it all as worship. I see it all as stewardship. I see it all as a conversation that I bring my kids in, I bring my wife in. And man, it's so much more fun. And uh, so that, that would be the biggest thing, I think, in, in a very small amount of time. There's a lot of things, but yeah. that would be the biggest thing, I think, that's changed so you, you, for me. You're saying you wish you had learned that earlier. I wish I had learned that earlier. But that's thank right. God you've learned it. Yes. Thank God you've learned it. I hear this statement all the time, work-life balance drives me nuts because that means that these things have to compete against each other because for something to be in balance, 
They have to be countering. That's right. That's right. It's right? the wrong word. It's the wrong word. It's the wrong word picture, too. And I just love this concept of integration, that it's all holistic. It's all moving towards the same end, and that is worship. Mm. And I love it. You know, we, we've talked about on the program before, the Hebrew word for worship is avoda, and mm. it's that word that means both work and worship. Mm-hmm. We see it always interchanged throughout Scripture, and so that's what you're talking about mm. is an integration, that it's all work, it's all worship, it's all one and the same, correct? Absolutely. St. Francis of Acadia was asked one day as he was hoping his garden. If Jesus were to come back today, you know, what would you do, St. Francis? Uh, and he says, I'd finish hoeing my garden. Uh, and he understood that it's, it's no more spiritual for me to be a good steward of my garden than it is for me to go share my faith. But uh, we can unpack that at another time. But that's this holistic nature that, that all is worship, whether I eat or drink, whatever I do, you know, I want to glorify God through, uh, through those things. Now, I got to stop there because what you just shared could be a profound insight for somebody, especially a first time listener here, right? Mm -hmm. Are you saying to us that this business person who's out making sales calls or producing a product or a service or a worker who's a manager or leader, that their work, the hands on of what they're doing with their work, that that itself is as holy and as important in the eyes of God than what's happening in church on Sunday? Absolutely. Are you, that's what you're telling. I'm, I'm telling you that. And you um, believe it. And I believe and it. And I do too. And I believe it. And I think if anytime you want to kind of understand some of that, that, that perspective, you got to look pre-fall. you got to look before, before the fall. And what did God give Adam to do? He gave him work. You know, the first assignment to Adam was a marketing, a branding assignment to name, to name the animals. He gave the larger plan. And the plan was to go from a garden to a city. That's been the plan all along for us to build the city. Uh, right before the Hebrews chapter of faith, it talks about all the different you know, heroes of the faith. And it's amazing if you go in there and look and it says, and they look to the city that, that was to come. They did not reach it now, but they knew there was a city that they longed for. And so they understood this principle, I think, even better than we do uh, today with all of our technology and, and we get so focused in on business, but that business and creating art and infrastructure is a part of worship. It is a part of the, the master plan to build the city from a garden to a city. Now, we also have the privilege of, of being a part of inhabiting that city, but most people think the Christian life is only about having an impact on people so that they come to Christ uh, and they can be a part of the city. But there's also a city that he says he'll refine that we get to build yeah, while good. we're on this earth. Believe it or not, we're at the tail end of this. And boy, this program, it goes by so fast with such incredible guests, with wisdom and insights as you've shared with us. So I, I talked to you about before we started recording the program that there was going to be one question yep. that I was going to end our time with. This is what I call my 423 question. And it's based out of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, where Solomon writes this. He says, above all else, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. Mm. And Cord, the reason I like to ask this question is the last. There are some biblical scholars who believe that these may have been among the last words that Solomon wrote. And we know he gave us Proverbs, he gave us much out of Ecclesiastes. Just this was a man who God gave such wisdom to. So I've kind of painted this picture Mm. that he's towards the tail end of his life. And he's saying, I know I've given you all this wisdom. I've given you all these things to live by. I want you to remember this one thing. Mm. Above all else, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. So, Cord, mm. you're a young man. We've, we've learned that here. We don't know when your last day on earth is going to be, mm-hmm. but let's say that you knew that it was coming, and you had a chance to gather those who are most precious to you, and you have a chance to give them your above all else advice. So here you go, Cord. Here's your chance. Above all else. Above all else, there are three battles that must be won. George Washington had eight battles. He only won three. He only needed to win three. There are three battles we must win. It's the battle for fellowship, first of all. Number one, the enemy wants to take us out of fellowship to get us alone, to get us isolated. That's when he can then, number two, the battle for a pure heart. That is guarding the heart specifically in this generation, especially, but it was no different back in in the Bible days as well. Guarding the heart against the lust of the flesh, the lust of uh, the pride of life and and of ego and and finances. So guarding the heart above all else, the purity of the heart. And then finally in three is the battle to stay on mission. 
And so that's those are the three battles I take my my son with through with his friends every every month. We do a we do a battle time. We call it the Fellowship of the Crest, and we we focus on those three battles, and we just continue to go deeper and deeper in those three battles. So the battle for fellowship, the battle for a pure heart, and the battle to stay on mission. And I think if you keep that in, in, the, in your frame of reference and you focus on fighting those battles, you know, all by God's grace, all, not, not right. by our works, all sure, by God's sure. grace, of course. It's not something we do. We do through him. But there's where we focus our attention. Whew, good stuff. I've been taking notes, and I, I hope you're not taking notes if you're driving, but if you're not driving, listening to the program, I hope you're taking notes, too, because I sure have. And so, uh, Cord, just thank you. Really, thank you for the time that you've invested with us here at Bottom Line Faith. Well, it's an honor. It's a privilege. I, I hope uh, that it has an impact. I'm sure it will. And uh, it's you know, anytime I can, can serve and be a part, I'd, I'd love to be a part. Well, folks, you have been listening to Bottom Line Faith, and our guest today has been Cord Sachs. He is the CEO at Fire Seats. To learn more about Cord and his company and how they are really discovering, deploying, and developing and multiplying leaders, check out fireseats.com. I think you'll be glad you did. Well, folks, this is your co-host, Ray Hilbert. Check out all of our other episodes at Bottom Line Faith. Dot org and check out our ministry website at truthatwork.org. Until next time at Bottom Line Faith, God bless and we'll see you soon.